Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Paul Regelbrug, the Center's Professional Development and Curriculum Coordinator. Uh, thank you to our community partners supporting today's program, the Seattle Genealogical Society and the Cornell Club of Western Washington. Thank you also to Michelle Quinones, who will be providing closed captioning. This week and last, students and educators across the state of Washington have either celebrated or dreaded the annual rite known as the first day of school. But for most, this first day of school has been unlike any other in history. In the place of books, favorite new clothes, the sounds and smells of pencils being sharpened, and the excitement of embracing old friends and seeing new ones, students today mostly just rolled out of their beds, maybe, opened up their laptops and said hello, maybe, to their new classmates. If their already stressed out, overwhelmed teachers are lucky, the students might even show and unmute themselves rather than hide behind their blackened screens. But in life, successful people take the hands with which they are dealt and rise above, looking at new challenges, not as obstacles, but as new opportunities. At the Holocaust Center, we have done our best to continuously fulfill our mission to use the lessons of the Holocaust to promote equity and combat hatred, prejudice, racism, and indifference. Just one example of how we have adapted our resources to continue to serve teachers and students in this new world of remote, virtual, or hybrid instruction is our Speakers Bureau. Today's guest speakers, Barbara Sachs DeSaro and daughter Andrea, are joined by Barbara's eldest grandson, Matthew. Barbara and Andrea are illustrative members of our Speakers Bureau, working with us to smoothly adapt their in-person presentation into a virtual one. And we are all their lucky beneficiaries. Our Speakers Bureau comprises nearly 30 active speakers and continues to be available to schools and other audiences across the Pacific Northwest via Zoom. The mission of the Speakers Bureau is to provide a personal connection to the Holocaust for students of all ages and show them a human face and story that listeners can reflect upon to confront bigotry and intolerance today. Hearing speakers give testimony helps students find their own voice and helps teach them to be responsible citizens in our community, our nation, and our world. Barbara Sachs de Saro, born in 1927, was adopted by Jewish parents and spent her formative years in Berlin enmeshed within the hatred and anti-Semitism of the Nazi party before her parents skillfully immigrated to the United States. Barbara is lovingly known as Omi in her family. Andrea, one of Barbara's four children, is a middle school special education teacher. Grandson Matthew is an electronics engineer. Our speakers will answer questions at the end of the program. Please type in your question at any time into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much, Barbara, Andrea, and Matthew for joining us today for this program. So great to see everyone. Matthew is here. We're just waiting for Omi to log on and get us started. For people who can see the PowerPoint, one of our favorite uh, family pictures is her on the left on the first day of kindergarten. Um, and interestingly, Matthew went back there to that exact location. And we'll talk about that uh, today during our presentation. So Omi, good to see you there. Good to be here. Yeah, my name is Andrea and my mother, Barbara, that we'll call Omi and Matthew is down here at the bottom. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Omi's eldest grandson and um, my aunt Andrea and I will be um, helping her tell her truly uh, fantastic story of escaping Nazi Germany for a new life in the US. Next slide. So this Omi is just a little overview of how we created this PowerPoint and um, a tiny bit on how we got connected here with the Holocaust Center. 
And I remember the very first time you came to my school before we were with the Holocaust Center and how kids had so many questions. And was that what motivated you to continue? Yes. It did. It was good response on the part of the students. There was interest. Now this, you want me to comment on this picture? Yeah. Okay. The, this was in uh, Silesia, I think, which is a province of Germany. And, my, and I will get into that more later. Uh, I was sent often to different places so I wouldn't be discovered to be adopted by an Aryan. Everyone knows what Aryan is. Aryan means that you have no Jewish ancestors anywhere. And uh, so if the Nazi had found that, they would have taken me away from my parents. Anyhow, this was in Silesia, I think, and we went there with vacations, and I guess I'm doing balance beam, which means it's an offense. <laughs> nice, next slide. So Paula already gave us a tiny overview on how you were um, adopted and you thought it was a teen pregnancy and how did they find you to adopt you? Well, it was interesting because Andrea, which you see right here, uh, it was very interested more than any of the other, other grandchildren or children of what, what happened because we didn't have any data as to who my, uh, my father, my, well, genetic father was. And uh, so somehow Andrea got hooked up with a woman in, in Texas who made a life work to uh, connect people, uh, survivors in Germany with survivors in the United States. That's how we found out a lot of this information. Let's look at the next slide because we'll see more detail on that. Well, here you see uh, in the middle there's uh, at the top middle, there's Denmark on the left side, on the east, west side of Denmark, it, of uh, uh, Denmark, yes, is the North Sea, and the right side is the, what we call it again? Uh, the Baltic, and then we, we see Rostock, where we found out you were born there. Yeah. And let's look at the next one, because we'll see your um, birth certificate in a minute. And this is a little overview of what was happening at that time that uh, Matthew's going to fill us in on. Yeah, so as I'm sure uh, most of you are, are familiar, um, Germany prior uh, to the um, First World War was a uh, very strong, very proud, uh, powerful country. And the loss of the war was a very demoralizing um, blow to their society. And um, unfortunately uh, for, the, for the German people, the um, reparations imposed um, by, uh, uh, um, on them after the war caused a um, very serious economic depression and skyrocketing unemployment and um, hyperinflation, which were things that had not really been felt uh, in, 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 if at all, if not in generations, by the German people. Um, and unfortunately, um, rather than addressing some of the root cause of this, many, not just in Germany, um, blamed uh, socialists, communists, Jews, gypsies, um, and other, um, you know, minority groups for the, for the loss of the war and the plight of the German people. What was interesting is that there's an undercurrent all over the world <clears throat> of anti-Semitism. It's hidden. It was there, and Hitler took advantage of that, had a scapegoat. He especially uh, targeted uh, Jews, that means Jews even genetically. Uh, <clears throat> not, they may not be practicing Jews, and also gypsies. He's, and it's convenient to have this group, two groups of people to blame. The, Matthew's um, going to say, thank you. Um, so, uh, again, as is fairly well known, uh, the Nuremberg Laws enacted shortly after the Nazis came to power defined anyone with Jewish grandparents as a Jew. And, and this is significant because this included a lot of people who did not consider themselves to be Jewish, 
and would not, prior to the extremism of the Nazi regime, have even been considered in their social circles to be Jewish. Um, and that included my uh, great grandparents, Omi's adoptive parents. And well, this is a birth certificate. Well, we should talk about how we got that. Uh, my parents, uh, being aware of all this, uh, I was three months old when I was adopted, and uh, they and they transferred uh, my birth certificate, which is a copy, to Berlin, and uh, uh, destroy. And then they just destroyed it. So. If the Nazis were looking for any excuse to deport me or whatever, uh, the it would, would would not be available. But the the social worker that Andrea, my daughter, uh, discovered there was a woman in Texas. Good We're just putting uh, Omi on pause for a minute because there's an announcement that's really loud, but she's about to say um, that the social worker who found her actual parents figured out that it had the birth certificate in Berlin had been destroyed, that her parents had probably, adoptive parents had probably bribed people, um, but she had been able to find in Rostock a different social worker friend who found it on that date. You can see at the very, very bottom, it says July 2000, so that was when we were able to find that birth certificate um, and find my mother's um, actual place of birth and parents. And she, my mother originally didn't like that because there was so much fear um, and avoidance in, you know, my grandparents, the people who adopted her, even after the war and decades later that we do see in people from that time of the Holocaust survivors. So I felt like I had to wait until my grandparents had passed to do this kind of search. And my mother originally didn't love it either. Um, she said, I thought I was the um, illegitimate daughter of Marlena Dietrich. I liked that. <laughs> she liked that a little better. Um, and she was still carrying, you know, the, that kind of fear and that kind of avoidance um, from these difficult times on this emotional level. I'd like to just interject quickly here that um, it really shows the fact that they had gone to the trouble of transferring the birth certificate and, and having it uh, removed, shall we say, from the official archives in Berlin just shows the level of planning and care that my great grandparents went to to uh, save themselves and their and their daughter and ultimately allow my family our family to exist and uh, we owe them a a great deal for that thank you next slide so this omi is where you're standing on the first day of school on those steps hawk near us and this is the tradition you notice the uh, backpack and then you notice the uh uh, what we call that thing that uh, it's a Jules, Jules Tute, she's you're holding candy there in a cone. Yeah, that's it's the first day of school. You get that, not after that. <laughs> okay, and notice how uh, uh, everybody wore these little boots. I had it, Every, everybody wore those, and it was very convenient. If you want to go ice skating, you just have, have clamp on ice skates and you're off. You don't have to change shoes. The roller skating was not. Ever, I never came across it in Germany. Okay. So I'm just going to give a little bit more historical background here. <clears throat> Again, please bear with me. I'm sure that a lot of you are very familiar with this, but we all just want to be on the same page. So um, we need to remember that the um, Weimar Republic was a fledgling democ democracy. It was a quite a... Um, weak government. It didn't have the checks and balances and the long traditions um, that enable a democracy to survive some difficult times. Um, so when the Nazis, uh, um, the Nazi party won the um, majority of parliament seats in 1933 and Hitler was appointed chancellor on January 30th of that year, it was very easy uh, for him to be come the de facto a dictator with the enabling act. 
um, almost immediately. Um, and at that point, uh, uh, him and his party really consolidated power and there was not a functioning democracy in Germany. Okay, now there was a, uh, the three pictures of uh, a park near, very close to us. We, my, my mother and I always walk every day. That's very German to go spazieren. Anyhow, uh, here's a, uh, a picture of people who were uh, considered Jews. This is before they got real strict and they had to wear a gold star, the gold star. There was a park near us, you always go walking. And there was a woman with the gold, uh, sitting on the uh, uh, yellow bench wearing a gold star. And I said, ask mother, what's that all about? And she rushed off to, uh, and talk and change subjects. So I never found out what it was. I never knew Nazis weren't wonderful until I got uh, to Switzerland, I guess. <laughs> now, oh, the Brandenburg tour, that, that's the idea of, uh, Marching. Marching. And also this is, you were saying about how anti-Semitism was already oh, widespread. Yes. yes, widespread, but not, not openly. I mean, not openly, uh, not openly, that's all. <laughs> okay. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, marching. So this is when you saw the SS man marching near your house? Well, that was, that was something else. But first, marching was a big, you know, it always was a big thing in Germany, marching in time. Everybody's right leg is up at the same time. And, uh, and, and it's quite strenuous. You try walking a mile with your legs up like that. Anyhow, it was a big deal for, and Germans loved it. And I, I liked marching too. It was fun. It was music. It was action. You know, the kids like that. And then the, the other point here is we lived in an apartment house. And there was an SS, SS is worse than, it's more like Gestapo, you know, they're, they're more virulent or what do you want to call it, uh, than just Nazi soldiers. So in front of our apartment house, there was an SS man doing a step, a little boy behind them imitating him. And maybe if that happened here, the kids would make fun of him. Nobody, nobody made fun of the Nazis, especially in SS man. And let's see. Okay, this. What happened is my head, I had all the childhood diseases the uh, year before I was sent to Switzerland, and uh, I hooping cough and, and measles, all that because there were no vaccinations except for smallpox. And they sent me to Switzerland, which was quite common if child hadn't been so well, you sent me to, you sent the person, the child to the uh, fresh air and good exercise and all that in Switzerland. So I was sent to this Kinderheim. A kinder means children, heim means home. So these were very popular and used much in Europe. So the parents could go for a vacation and the kids were in, in the Kinderheim and everything was just fine. So this was at Algoza, which is a, uh, a, a milder version of summer it's in, in Switzerland. So they sent me there and, and uh, this was Fastnacht, which is like uh, uh, Halloween here and people came in, in uh, costumes. And this was Algoza, which was the name of the place. And this is a lake and people at Arro the, the place I was at was, was farther uh, toward us and they had horse racing on the lake. This, the lake is where I'm behind me, okay. And this is, uh, okay, Ohio Hitler, right. I, my parents sent me first to one a private school and every morning we had, when we came, we had to have the three, two, no, two long patriotic uh, songs. One was uh, uh, Gestapo one, the other one was the old German Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. And you had to have a uh, Heil Hitler pose for all that time. And my arm would get very tired, but I was doing it for sure. And here, I guess we should talk about the sweater, right? <laughs> well, no, mention about um, what happened when the schools closed. Because yeah. your parents didn't want you to go to the 
uh, even public school or private school was closed? All the private schools were closed and all the children had to go to uh, Gestapo, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Hitler kind of. And this is their morning while they're singing the long two uh, patriotic songs. And as I say, that's what I'm, I'm retired and I thought I was doing it for a cause. You know? And then you had the tutor I just had, for English. Yeah, first I had, I had the two, two different private schools which were closed. And uh, so the uh, Jewish background people, kids, would not have any place to go to school. But I was, one of our relatives was a teacher, so they sent me there to learn English. So my father was looking ahead. But you didn't know you were going to be going to America, right? No, no, I knew nothing that Nazis aren't wonderful because children talk, you know. So that was that, was that right. And after, so, so after the, uh, uh, closing of all the, of the private schools. I, I didn't have an official school, so I, I said to this relative to, to learn English. So by the time I got to the United States, I, I knew pretty good English. And of course, just to, in case it wasn't obvious, the Kinderheim was also a way of uh, getting you away from the, the Nazis, right? Absolutely, but that was mentioned, of course. I didn't know Hitler wasn't wonderful. And, and there was in the in the Kinderheim in the morning we'd have skiing, in the afternoon we have ice skating and something else in the evening. I, I loved all that stuff, you know. So, so <laughs> meanwhile the other kids were you probably saw the parades or the Hitler Youth doing a bunch of activities. That was still like, I was in Germany. So right, right. I was in Switzerland, which was very neutral. Very right. neutral. And you told me that you wanted to have the same kind of sweater that the Hitler Youth kids were wearing. Because had a black knit wool sweater, and there was uh, red, green, and white stripes on. And I wanted a sweater like that too. And my my mother would get it for me. Then finally, after much urging on my part, she got me the, a sweater with different colors. <laughs> and I was satisfied with that. And 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 of of course, Omi, you couldn't have the one that had the Nazi Youth colors. Because no. that, that would identify me as a as a Hitler youth person, and I and that would mean I had to go to all these meetings. I would probably be discovered because that I was not. Uh, what's the word again? I was. Uh, anyhow, I was. I wasn't a real Nazi, you know. So, anyhow, that's the story of of uh, he is marching, and I wanted to march too, you know. I I like that. And uh, I didn't, <laughs> because it was too dangerous, because the Germans have very good records and kept all this genealogy in their records. Now, this is war marching, isn't it? And the summer camp. And the summer camp. Athletic which, games, yeah. Which I loved, you know. As, and here's Hitler checking the Hitler youth. And here's more propaganda and uh, Strasbourg. Do you remember, Paul, uh, uh, what this is about? That's the... Um, it was a summer camps. And summer all that. sports, a yeah. A lot of things kids would like. Yeah. And marching and music, marching music and Hitler, Hitler singing. And uh, he wasn't singing, but the people were singing. And this was a... Uh, okay, you can't quite see this. I'm over here, is that right? On the bottom right, the yeah. Bottom, yeah. And this was a... a, a, a town hall in a little town in one of the provinces in Germany. And my father took, a, took this picture. This was a Nazi thing, the, this tower and, and the insignia on top, uh, to, uh, to get the little towns uh, supporting Hitler. And my father took a picture of, of this and they put me, I don't know if you can see that, in the uh, right, well, it's, it's the U is left, I guess. Uh, Picture, uh, I was standing over, over in, on one side, and, and the idea was, we thought, my parents thought, that it was a very bad photographer taking a picture of me and having me in front of this building. But my father happened to be a very good photographer. So this was something to, uh, to be careful about. As normally, I would have been right in front of that building because he was a good photographer. And so they had these uh, things. Oh, and that, that's a photograph at the time, and this is what it is now. 
which is interesting, isn't it? There's no uh, Nazi thing. And it's a nice building, too. Okay. Oh, the, Olymp the Olympics. I was. I saw some of the, uh, the winter Olymp. No, the summer Olympics. This was in Berlin, and the, uh, what impressed me as we went there was all these flags hanging in front of the uh, apartment house. And then this picture is a, a uh, street going to the Olympic Stadium. And notice the, all the Nazi flags. And I was concerned that it covered up the windows and how would people get enough light in there? This was my main concern, <laughs> light in their apartments. I was, this was in 1936, it says here. And here is, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens. Now this was a great uh, problem for Hitler because not only wasn't he a Nazi, not only wasn't he a German, he was black and black people were inferior. And, and all everybody who wasn't German was inferior. And, he, <laughs> and this was, Hitler left the stadium. But this was uh, broadcast, they didn't have, they only had, uh, Newspaper. They did not have TV at that time. This is another one I didn't see that was uh, fencing. And I don't think the uh, Nazis won either. So uh, he, he didn't spend that much time at the Olympics. <laughs> but the, you went to see the uh, fencing and we'll see a couple other pictures that your father took. Yeah. This was, this, uh, this was uh, speed uh, racing. And they track were, and field and the long jump. Track and field and all that. None yeah. of that I saw. But. Yeah. And we love this one that shows the Olympic torch. And then uh, Matthew's going to mention about how this was particularly shaming for Hitler. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just to give a little bit of historical context here, um, <clears throat> Hitler and the Nazi party uh, saw the 1936 games not just as a sporting event, but as proof to the world that Germany was back and more powerful than ever. Um, one indication of this was that he uh, stopped at nothing and at huge expense and technological um, um, innovation made the 36 Olympics, that's what my grandmother was, was mentioning, um, the world's first live televised sporting event. This was a very big deal at the time. So to have someone who he perceived as inferior win um, all those gold medals I'm talking about Jesse Owens here was deeply humiliating for for him and uh, and his party. A bit of a um, <clears throat> indicator of what might what was to come. And they also uh, non Nazis won the uh, rowing. Uh, nobody nobody Nazi won the rowing. So this this was part of that. Oh, here this was uh, the Winter Health. With Winter Health, yeah, that's right, okay. Well, there was a program where uh, Nazi volunteers would go into your apartment if you're living in, in uh, Berlin or any big city and go in your kitchen, look in the pot because it's supposed to be Winter Health, Winter, being, winter Health of being health. And everybody on, on Wednesday would have to have a sort of a, stew, a one pot dish, you know, like a stew not the vegetables and uh, and the other components of a dinner and, and meat and so on. And this is an uh, ad showing the uh, uh, housefrau uh, cooking and a, a little girl and the family watching. And you're supposed to contribute money that's supposed to go to Winterhelfer. Uh, the Winterhelfer was supposed to help poor people in winter. And, but really we found out afterwards, it went to finish the German uh, Ausbahn, uh, Wind, where was it, Ausbahn? The, the Autobahn. Autobahn, thank you. Can't remember my German. Okay, and that's the finish. That Autobahn was to move military, but no, nothing went to poor people. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Matthew will tell us about the Kristallnacht. So again, um, quite well known, but just for some historical context, um, the uh, Kristallnacht on November 9 of uh, 1938 uh, was uh, translated as the Night of Broken Glass. And, and this was a um, very sad day when um, 
Nazi organized quasi grassroots um, mobs uh, burned um, synagogues, looted and destroyed Jewish businesses. Um, and approximately 90 people were killed. Um, and this marked a turning point uh, toward the Holocaust. Prior to this, the had been oppression of the Jews in more subtle ways, but this was the first time that there was overt um, wide-scale violence that was uh, tolerated and encouraged, sadly. Um, so following Kristallnacht, Nazi leaders um, stepped up Aaronization efforts, uh, basically banning Jews from holding positions of, of importance and power um, in, in Germany, such as public schools, universities, government positions, etc. Um, and uh, Jews were forced uh, into um, sp uh, uh, specialized um, um, housing, the beginning of the ghettos in many cities as well. This is the radio when you were listening to the radio with your Uncle Robert. Okay. My parents, in those days, radio is uh, much bigger than this. <laughs> I remember my parents and Uncle Robert uh, gathering around the, the uh, radio and listening. And of course, this was when Hitler talked, he screamed, as opposed to Churchill who was an orator, Hitler was a screamer. And they all are listening and worrying about what I, I, I wasn't interested. <laughs> and that's just a picture of that. Uncle Robert isn't in there. Oh, and here was myself with the arrow uh, in uh, Arosa, that's where the Kinderheim was. And the, the, one of the girls, there were two girls uh, from, from Germany, I guess, who, who were also at this Kinderheim. And they, their parents were sort of sympathizers of Nazis. But I didn't know any of that, so they rented a sled with a horse and took us around. It was fun. <laughs> so you associated Hitlerism with fun, you know. Now, is this... Uh, this is when your father found the sponsors? Oh, yeah. In order to immigrate to Germany, you had to have two sponsors. Now, as it was, most of the family... The, my parents' family, my adopted parents' family left. The, uh, and Uncle Robert said it's going to blow over, and he, he ended up in, in uh, Auschwitz. But everybody else left the South Africa, the United States, Ireland, Britain, other places. So uh, my parents uh, realized uh, go back one, okay? And there was skiing where we went. <laughs> And, he, and, and that was uh, part of the program at this uh, uh, Kinderheim. Anyhow, uh, we, uh, what had, we, my father saw what was coming and he, he was a patent attorney and he went to Germany because he had to have two sponsors to emigrate to the United States. And one of them was a relative. The other one was a, a wealthy family who uh, was a client of his because the, the, he did international patents also. And he got both of them to sponsor us, three of us, you know, my mother, father, and myself. And that, uh, let's see. We wanted to look at the skiing picture because when they left, you were saying to pick you up in Switzerland, they brought their skis with them so it looked like a ski vacation. Right, exactly. And that was the second winter I went. And the excuse was I had all these childhood diseases and a lot of people sent their children to fresh air and all that. It was a time you you treated TB with going into Switzerland. <laughs> and that was fun. Next slide. And this oh, is when uh, you got on the boat. Yeah, well, that is some before. That, what happened is, first of all, my father got, it was early enough, he got visas to go to Germany to arrange things. And then uh, they, uh, we had a car at that time. Uh, we went to, from Germany to Switzerland, I think we're in Austria in between. And uh, uh, we stayed with my aunt, who was my mother's sister, in uh, Versailles. Versailles is a suburb of Germany, and it, uh, 
lot of, they had a my sister my aunt had a a kinderheim there where people would you know if you want to go on vacation somewhere you put your kids there and you go and it's their license and it's and there's some school i think i don't remember much school but anyhow this was the ile de france and that sailed from la havre which is a, a coastal town so uh we all get, my father had um, tickets everything was okay and Let's look at the pictures he took of you on the Ile de France and when you first arrived in the New York Harbor. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the one before this, isn't it? No, this <laughs> is the one when you arrive, and this is the picture he took on that foggy day. This is the uh, Statue of Liberty, and the boat was going here. Everybody rushed to that side of the boat because they wanted to see the Statue of Liberty, all the people on the boat. And I was afraid that the boat would tilt. <laughs> I was about 10 then, yeah. But let's see that. Look how cute you are. Let's look at the picture of you on the deck. Oh, yeah. That's my father. And everybody, uh, all the girls in those days wore long stockings with a garter belt, which held the stockings up. There was no pants in those days. And here I am on the boat. And here's, I get my mother, isn't it? I guess it must be. Yeah, and we were on it was a five-day journey. There was a storm, and everybody uh, got seasick except my father. And there was a gym on boat, which I went to, <laughs> and uh, there was a, a, a make-believe uh, horse, and it's, a, it's people who ride horses so they could have some exercise. And I got on it, and I think it was part of my seasickness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's that's that. Oh, and then when we got to Germany, well... Got to America. <laughs> Boy, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I was uh, put into fourth grade, even though I knew German. But of course, they th I should have been in sixth grade. But after a few weeks, they put me into sixth grade, where I should have been, because I knew I could speak and understand German. Well, you and already you knew English. English. Yeah, from your tutor. Yeah, I'm back in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's a, a recorder lesson in school. That's when the school was still open. That was in the United States. And let's look oh, at the United next States. one. Correct. Yeah, yeah, this is when you get to America. This and is then now, yeah. what happened when um, you first arrived there and how did other kids treat you? Badly. Okay, they called me names on the street, across the street, either Jew or, or Nazi. Of course, that was neither. But uh, you learn to just ignore that. And I went to, I say, I went to the uh, fourth grade and then they put me in, in sixth grade that's because I could speak English. And, and again, there's, uh, I, I, there wasn't any friendly reception or anything like that. And uh, this is much later. This is a family, myself, a teenager, and my mother and father. Uh, well, when we first came, we stayed in some place in uh, Times Square. All the apartments in uh, Berlin had cockroaches. So a German housewife, that was, <laughs> that was terrible. And even after we moved from there to an apartment farther upstream, up on, the, on, on Manhattan, there were still cockroaches. And one thing was they had a, a garbage dump and the, uh, they had different floors. And, and so you took your garbage and stuck and made, dropped it down. And of the cockroaches had a good time. <laughs> but my mother was shocked. When we went to Switzerland afterwards, that would never have happened. And the Germans too, they're very clean. But in, in, uh, when we first stayed in, in, in Times Square for a few weeks before we moved to an apartment, uh, Germans are very clean as a Swiss, uh, as Swiss people. So again, my mother was still a horde. Uh, they were, for German housewife of cockroaches. They were in an apartment. They weren't just staying in the garbage dump. Okay. Is that when um, you learned you were adopted at that time when you came to America? I, well, okay, well, I never knew I was adopted till I was 12. Because my, well, first of all, people didn't talk about things like that. And then uh, uh, my parents didn't think, uh, I was, they were still afraid of, of being uh, discovered of not being Nazis. Of course, Switzerland was very neutral, and all the 
uh, tunnels and, uh, and bridges going from Switzerland to the rest of the world well, had bombs and planned. Swiss was neutral. Swiss was neutral. So Matthew's going to Matthew's going to say what was happening in Germany at that time. Okay. After you left. Well, well after I left, uh, Hitler was uh, was everything, and here we have the uh, ghettos. Yeah, Matthew's going to mention what happened in Germany here. Okay, you go ahead. So, um, we our family was extremely lucky to um, get out. Well, it was part of, part of my parents doing. My father. Abso yeah. Absolutely. Um, in 1933, uh, there were approximately half a million um, Jews in Germany. Um, and uh, by 1939, approximately half of those had, had managed to escape. Um, just give some more uh, timeline. By, by 41, all, all Jews in, in Germany and the lands they conquered were required to wear the yellow star and by late uh, 1942 um, all uh, remaining German Jews were uh, deported to Auschwitz including my uh, uh, great uncle uh, Robert. Um, he said it's going to blow over he said. We're yes. going to tell about him in a moment. <laughs> and finally uh, uh, the, the tragedy of the Holocaust uh, uh, took the lives of approximately six uh, million Jews who were murdered in in, in death camps or or otherwise um, met their their end at the um, hands of the Nazis. Right, and that's Uncle Robert. Okay, he was a, a banker, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he worked maybe at a, Matthew will tell it. Yeah, he worked at a. A bank, a bank in Berlin. Yeah. He was a very powerful and prominent member of uh, of, of, of society, and, and considered himself to be above all of this nonsense, and that thought that it would just blow over. Um, unfortunately, that was not what happened. Um, in 1934, he was uh, fired um, as part of the Aryanization uh, efforts, <clears throat> uh, specifically under the law for restoration of the professional silver civil service. Um, after that, he worked at the Reich Association of Jews and was forced to move to a Jewish house. Um, on October 20th of, of 42, the Gestapo arrested all members and um, remaining employees of Jewish institutions in Berlin. Um, he was one of the lucky few to um, escape, but uh, he was eventually caught on January 21st, 43 at uh, 47 years old. Slide, please. Um, and uh, he was murdered at, uh, at Auschwitz. Um, our French cousin, uh, Cyril, um, uh, went to some um, effort to document this, which is why we know. Um, and um, my aunt will speak about what this uh, ceremony represents. Right, you can look it up under the Stolperstein um, documenting stones, and that's uh, and he that is done throughout Germany to uh, document right in front of the house, the last house where a Jewish person lived prior to being sent to the concentration camp. So that's done now throughout Germany was a private effort, but you can look online and find out about it. Um, and I think the, our Holocaust Center has more details. I'm aware of the time, so let's move on to one or two more slides of when you went to Cornell, Omi, and here you are in undergraduate school playing at Oberlin Tennis. Well, yeah. Okay, Oberlin was a very uh, liberal, a very, what to say, very classic uh, liberal arts college. And uh, one reason I went there is because they had no fraternities or sororities. And in high school, they did. In high school, can you get imagine? Anyhow, and I had one girl committed suicide because she wasn't uh, asked to join. Anyhow, I always liked sports. And here's, he's playing tennis. And what else is there here? There was a chapel built in, uh, oh, I, I, well, I would have gone to a high school in, in Manhattan, which already then had drugs. I mean, bad drugs. <laughs> and so my parents moved 
uh, to uh, a suburb uh, of Ber of uh, Berlin, not Berlin, of America. So and you were telling about the chapel where you got married yeah, uh, in Cornell. And now I want Matthew to tell about this favorite picture. This is our father, my father, um, Arthur DeCero, um, who got the job and then you moved to New Jersey at uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories. Um, Matthew's just gonna make a comment on that because we're moving ahead here. Yeah. So uh, Omi um, met Opa, as we call him, L. Arthur DeSaro, uh, when they were both uh, graduate students at, uh, at Cornell. Um, Arthur DeSaro was a um, semiconductor pioneer at Bell Telephone Laboratories. Um, he uh, helped develop uh, some of the very first lasers, uh, semiconductor lasers, as well as uh, what is, was recognized by the Computer History Museum as a, um, one of the very early forerunners of the integrated circuit, the thing that powers all of our computers and cell phones. This is a photo of him with uh, uh, Ian Ross, who later uh, was the head of Bell Labs, working on that uh, stepping transistor, which was his um, very early IC. Um, you I'm see very him, proud of him with, the he was a major with the glasses. Yes, yeah, I am very proud of him, and he was a major inspiration uh, for me to get my uh, PhD in electrical engineering. Well, those these uh, pictures would happen when uh, I uh, was a uh, consultant dietitian nutrition, isn't he? I'm talking, giving some presentation on nutrition. And I also taught exercise classes. <laughs> and that's me demonstrating what you're supposed to do. And maybe oh, we'll jump I ahead to just some of the, we, have, we see a couple of the family with my two younger sisters and uh, my older brother, Eric, and we continue to do skiing. Oh yeah. Yeah, a lot, which was so uh, important in our background. And we wanna look at our final family picture. So this is a picture of most of the um, uh, surviving um, 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 family members of the DeSaro family in the U.S. Not not everyone, but but very close at our, our last big uh, family reunion um, for Omi's 90th birthday. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say how um, thankful and proud I am of my great uh, grandparents for getting her out of the country and allowing our family to um, survive and prosper in our new life in the United States. That's my own parents right there in the middle of the picture. And I'm in behind okay. them. I'm in the middle of the people sitting down. Yeah. And you can imagine some of these pictures took a long time when they're little children. And wow. <laughs> I think Paul is going to transition us to some questions and answers. Is that right, Paul? That's right. Thank you so much, Barbara, uh, Andrea, and Matthew for uh, that incredible uh, presentation. And yes, indeed, we do have several questions. So I guess uh, let's start with this one here. Um, this one comes from Mindy, and she asks, why did Barbara say, I was neither a Nazi nor a Jew? Did you know, um, I believe you had said at some point that you found out you were adopted at about the age of 12, but did you know at a certain point that your birth parents were non-Jews? No, because I, uh, I was told I was adopted when I was 12, and then I was only, you know, nine or 10. And so I didn't know. And that my parents were my real parents. And I was really shocked when I found I was adopted. Well, that's all right, they're still my parents. You know, so, so it, it didn't matter to me. Let me just speak a little bit here to add a, a, just a touch of clarity. The um, Omi's adoptive parents were not practicing Jews. They were um, only, um, would have been legally recognized as Jewish under the Nuremberg laws, but uh, considered themselves a assimilated um, um, Christian. We went then, to, uh, we could celebrate Christmas and Easter and all those things. Right? And they really wanted to fit in when they came to America. And I know they, oh, they joined a church right away. Right. Thank you. That, that actually sort of uh, springboard straight into, you know, several people had asked about, okay, if you weren't uh, raised with any sense of Judaism, which it doesn't sound like you were, um, how religious or what uh, role did religion play in your upbringing and in your life even today? And it sounds like you went to, you observed some of the major holidays, but was there um, observance beyond that? Not much. You went to church 
on uh, Christmas and Easter, but not Pfingsten, which is the resurrect element ascending. And then uh, there's another uh, holiday we, which was important during that, it was St. Nicholas Day, which is, which is really, wasn't that religious, but it, St. Nicholas was a saint, so I guess it was religious. And, and you hung up your stocking or your shoe outside the door. And then in the morning, it should have some candy or some other little toys in there. That was St. Nicholas Day, and uh, December 6th, I think it was. Right? And it celebrated a lot of Catholic circles. Right? But we, we weren't very religious growing up, and neither were your parents. They were more a little more intellectual and a little more culturally uh, connected. Very culturally. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Um, here's another good question. This one's from uh, Andrea H. Uh, and she asks, back in your childhood, Barbara, uh, when, you, when your parents did take you away, they were trying to purposely, it seems, keep you away from the whole Hitler youth and everything yeah. like that. What, do you recall, was that ever a topic of conversation among your friends? I mean, did that ever come up like, hey, Barbara, why aren't you here? Well, no, because first of all, when I went to a private school, where I imagine a lot of people like myself went, and I don't know. And uh, we did, uh, you know, I didn't have many friends because my parents kept me isolated so it wouldn't be discovered. And so uh, I got that special sweater, which wasn't special anymore. And uh, uh, then I didn't have many friends. I, we didn't have the gangs of People, people are friends now, because I was the only child. I was living with my parents. And they weren't really any, uh, uh, my two cousins from my mother's sister, that's my aunt, uh, uh, who would we get together and we sometimes and we'd have, uh, they were like, what do you call these gardens people have here? They, anyhow, they were gardens in, this, in, this, in Berlin and people could have a, a plot and you'd planted vegetables and flowers, I guess. And like so, we have the pea patches here in Seattle. Pea patch. But that was new. The little yeah. like gardens if you don't have enough room in your ha in your backyard. Exactly. They were hardly the apartment houses were in our backyards. And the, the the space we had between the apartments was uh, used by the maids to beat rugs. We had no vacuum cleaner. <laughs> That's traditional way of doing things. Yeah. Um, did there come a point, uh, uh, Barbara, or at what point in your life did your parents openly discuss or tell others about their experiences? And if so, um, what what do you recall their, was their hope that, uh, that you or others might learn from these experiences? Well, I don't think, I, I never knew that, my parents never talk politics. We talked about, they were very cultured. We talked about artists, art, art. I went to the major, as a little girl, major muse art museums in, in, in Germany. She, she was very cultured with big K. <laughs> so that's, I went to the Louvre, you know, in, in Paris and all that. So my background was very different from other kids in school. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, here's another question that came up from uh, ADW, and the question is, was the reason that your, the birth certificate was destroyed, was it because of the fear uh, that, that Barbara would be separated from her adopted parents? That's for That's sure. They knew. They would have uh, taken me away from my parents for me in Hitler. Year. That's, uh, that's absolute, absolutely right, and um, they didn't we don't believe that they suspected that a Holocaust or, or anything like that was coming. They were afraid that, uh, rightfully so, that the, the Nazis would not want a um, proper Aryan young woman being raised by suspicious characters like her parents. In, in, the, in the beginning, that was true. After a while, you know, as everybody was segregated, yeah. Sure. Now, uh, once uh, at what point, uh, a couple of people asked about this, is that at what point uh, did, did it come up, did the idea come, Andrea, uh, that 
you would, and I believe your sister, and now obviously uh, Matthew as well, would become part of this story? At what point did the family sort of link together to convey this story out to students and others? Well, not, certainly not in Germany. Uh, and, uh, well, of course they were born, all of them were born in the United States. And so my parents try to keep the German, the, the intellectual thing of Germany, of German language, because it's one of the languages that's taught in school. So we were supposed to speak German at dinner every Wednesday, but it's, <laughs> it's sort of uh, went away. <laughs> and so, part of the question uh, Paul was saying is, um, maybe you could repeat it, how did we get interested in presenting this story because it was kind of suppressed um, from my grandparents wouldn't really talk about it and it was rather secretive holding that fear still. Well of course there's a lot of fear in Germany so they figured it'd be transferred to here and there were Nazis here I mean but, but they were uh, not embraced but there was a Nazi uh, influence in the United States. Yeah, because Paul was just curious, how did we, you know, get to do this thing? And Matthew had a comment on that. Yeah, so, so the specific uh, story there is we really didn't know anything about the history, and we as the extended family, um, until Johanna Sox, um, Omi's um, adoptive mother, was at the very end of her life, and um, her husband had, had passed on. Um, my father... Um, uh, spent a bunch of time with her uh, when she was in a nursing home and and uh, uh, coaxed much of this story out and that's what sort of uh, began our own investigation which my my dear aunt Andrea here um, has really um, taken the lead in, in running with and, um, and and trying to to get out there. And being a teacher, um, I was able to bring my mother into a high school where I used to work. And then I said, I wonder if the Holocaust Center would be interested in this, you know, because I really didn't know that it was the right story. And then um, we all over the years have moved to Seattle from New Jersey. And it turns out the Holocaust Center was interested, which was a wonderful uh, surprise and felt very uh, important to me feeling of coming back in a sense of full circle and reclaiming this somewhat lost story. Well, that's wonderful. We sure appreciate it. And there's just uh, time for one last question and uh, it's for you, Barbara. And the question is, uh, what is it that you hope that, uh, or what message could you give or offer today's youth uh, based on your experiences? Well, the main message is get involved. What happened in Germany, the educated class was into opera and plays and music. They couldn't be bothered with all that. Uh, these were ruffians, you know, Hitler uh, corralled and, and to, to support him. And it was all stuff you don't want to bother with. You guys better get bothered, I'd say. Hey, you guys better get involved because it could happen here. Well, thank you so much. I, we sure appreciate that again. Uh, to Barbara, Andrea, and Matthew, you guys have done such a great job, and I wish we could continue this conversation, but we have to sort of bring this to a conclusion. So thank you again. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us today for this important program. This program has been recorded, and you will find it on our website starting tomorrow, along with other past Lunch and Learn presentations. I want to again thank the Seattle Genealogical Society, as well as the Cornell Club of Western Washington, for their uh, support of this program and their ongoing support. One of the best things you can do to support the Holocaust Center for Humanity is to tell others and to recommend our programs. Thank you for your support. I'd like to give a special thank you to Julia Thompson, our Education Resources Coordinator, who is also running the technical side of this program today. Also a huge thank you to our Executive Director, Dee Simon, and our entire team, Richard Green, Museum and Technology Director, Nicole Bella, Director of Development, Lori Warshall Cohen, who runs our Legacy Speakers Program, our Education Team, Director Alana Cohn Kennedy, Julia Thompson, and Rosa Campos, our Development Team, Sydney Dreitel and Ellie Seleski, and Senior Operations and Engagement Officer Amanda Davis, and our Administration Coordinator Katie Lawrence. 
I hope you will be able to join us next Tuesday at this time for a special presentation, How the Holocaust Shaped U.S. Senator Scoop Jackson's Human Rights Work, featuring Scoop's daughter, Anna Marie Lawrence, who will share photos of items her father received after having liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp in 1945, and the president of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, Craig Gannett. I hope to see you all next week. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes our program.